Ok. Ah, super. Bonjour Paris. Um, good afternoon everyone. Thank you very much for having us today presenting about uh, Green Software. Uh, I'm Dan and this is... Uh, Sh I'm Shimon. <laughs> Hi all. This is Shimon. So we, we both work for Avanad, uh, which is a member of the GSF, the Green Software Foundation, which we'll uh, cover in a second. Um, and we're a principal contributors to uh, one of the working groups of the GSF, which is the Carbon Aware SDK. So this is what we're here to talk about today. So what we'd like to do is uh, kind of take back uh, some of the principles to basics, cover some of the green software principles, and then we'll use those to build on uh, to talk about the Carbon Aware SDK at the end. So first of all, um, some of you might have seen the uh, Green Software uh, Foundation logo this morning when you came into the auditorium and wondered what it was about. So um, the Green Software Foundation is um, a non-profit organization that works to educate software professionals uh, on how to make their work more sustainable and have less impact through software um, on the environment. Um, so, um, um, so yeah, so it basically does that through uh, training, research, and advocacy, uh, uh, such as this. <laughs> um, so, so <clears throat> when we think about the the, the three scopes that uh, the greenhouse um, uh, the greenhouse protocol uh, defines, um, um, I, I'm assuming a lot of you are, are familiar with it. But just in case anyone isn't, uh, we've got three scopes. We've got the direct emissions, and I'm going to reuse. Um, an analogy from uh, um, uh, from uh, he's not here I think from uh, Chris Adams who's uh, uh, who's um, the founder of the Green Web Foundation this time with the web um, he, he he basically used an analogy in one of his last podcasts about uh, um, uh, 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 making hot beverages so imagine you want to make your own coffee. Uh, if you were to, <laughs> sorry, you're here. <laughs> I was looking for you everywhere. <laughs> um, it, it, it was basically using the analogy of uh, if you want to make, to make your own coffee, I hear that in the US we don't use a kettle, we use uh, a, a pan with uh, hot water. So you might switch on the gas and burn f uh, gas to, to, to get your, uh, um, your hot water to make your hot coffee. Uh, otherwise, you might be using the electricity if you're using a kettle. The electricity is coming from the national grid, and therefore, um, direct emissions that are uh, sorry, indirect emissions that are related to the generation of that electricity is the second scope. And the final scope, uh, which is uh, also indirect emissions, is supply chain. You go to a coffee shop. I really like that uh, uh, analogy, so I'm reusing it today. Um, so, so. What we see is that in all three of those scopes, there's going to be an implication with software. And what we're here to, to do today is to talk to you about that and the fact that obviously if you have an impact on software, you have an impact on all three of those scopes, and therefore you've got a way of really making an impact to the environment, uh, to the carbon footprint uh, on the environment. So I'll hand over to Shimon for the Green Software Principles. Thanks, Dan. So um, at the Green Software Foundation, we've established um, a few principles on how we should be, oh, well, what affects the uh, sustainability of software and how we as developers and also oh, anyone as human beings can uh, influence um, the impact of it and how can we build greener and more sustainable software. Um, generally, there are three different uh, aspects of uh, the, well, where emissions come from and how can we affect the sustainability and efficiency of software. And first one is on uh, the energy efficiency side. Um, so how can we consume the least amount of energy possible? Second one uh, talks about the efficiency of the hardware on which the software runs. And the third one, which we'll be covering in a bit, bit more detail and which the carbon aware SDK uh, is trying to address is carbon awareness. So how can we do more when electricity is uh, clean and do less when it's dirty? So carbon energy and efficiency, um, both of them, well, they're very closely linked to each other. First one is we want to emit the least amount of carbon possible. And that directly links to using the least amount of energy possible. And we'll get to, well, Hopefully everyone knows why, but just in case we'll 
briefly explain why. Um, we, when we look at carbon awareness later on, we don't want to be looking at all different greenhouse gases that, um, that, that are composed, because this just explodes the scope out, out a lot. And when we think about every single greenhouse gas and how it influences, it's, it's hard for a person coming into the space to uh, interlink then how, for example, a kilogram of methane relates to a kilogram of CO2 being released. Um, so we boil it down to looking at the CO2 equivalent. So how much of methane in the atmosphere is equivalent to X amount of CO2 or carbon for short uh, in the atmosphere. Um, and then energy efficiency, why does that um, really bother us is because, well, energy, as we know, comes from different, very different sources, right? Coal, gas, um, or hopefully also, well, um, more sustainable sources. And by minimizing our usage of it, we'll minimize, uh, by extension, the production of, of it. Um, also by um, increasing the utilization of software. So let's say we have software running on multiple um, multiple devices, multiple virtual machines, multiple servers, um, maybe increasing the efficiency, uh, sorry, increasing the usage on a single one would much more, um, what's efficiency, utilization will take down the total um, usage. Um, and the last three I will cover briefly, because uh, we don't want to dive into them too much, but we have the uh, principle of hardware efficiency beforehand mentioned. As we know, every single device, when it's produced, um, well, somehow it needs to be produced so some carbon will be released when it's being produced, and also some carbon will be released when it's uh, utilized at the end of its lifespan. And that is called embodied carbon, and that goes into the hardware efficiency side. Um, next one is measurements, so how do we actually measure the uh, the efficiency of software. One of the things I wanted to highlight in this space was the software carbon intensity specification um, that was released by the Green Software Foundation and is being developed by it um, still. Um, I think it was already mentioned uh, here beforehand. That was very nice to see. Um, and uh, the climate commitment aspect, so how do we understand the exact mechanisms of carbon reduction um, whether it's uh, offsetting or elimination of it. And now I'll hand off back to Dan to dive for a deeper dive on carbon awareness. Thank you. So, so yeah, so we mentioned the fact that um, the electricity doesn't come from uh, the same energy sources. There are varying uh, energy sources, and some are cleaner than others. Uh, we understand the renewables to be the cleaner ones, and uh, fossil fuel and gas to be uh, on the dirtier side. And carbon awareness um, is something I'm going to introduce in the next slide. <laughs> so, 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 so obviously carbon awareness is about like varying uh, volumes of those sources. When we think about what goes into the grid, how we get our electricity in, um, uh, you know, in our homes or in our plugs, um, it's the, the, the grid is composed of, of different sources and how much of which energy is going to be there is going to help us. So I think you introduced the, the carbon aware, um, the, the carbon equivalent uh, unit earlier. Um, and what we can see here is that when we've got um, uh, more renewable energies, we can see that the, the average rating is lower and when we use less, uh, uh, higher. And that's kind of what helps us determine whether, or wh whether we're talking about dirty or, or cleaner energy. So, so, so our goal here is then, um, sorry, so, so this, is, this is basically what happens on the grid. Um, you know, if uh, uh, one thing that, 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 is, that, is, uh, that is for sure is that we can't decide how much renewables are going to be able to generate at any point of time, whether it's going to be, the wind is going to be blowing uh, harder or at all, whether there's going to be enough sun. At night, obviously, that's not the case, um, um, etc. So, so what happens is that there has to be a minimum amount of the energy that comes from dirtier uh, sources uh, because that's what helps the national grid regulate 
um, the energy that flows through the through the, the, the I think the power lines we call them. Um, so uh, so here we've got three kind of like scenarios where we're going to need to have m uh, more uh, fossil fuel um, uh, generated. Uh, sorry, generated energy, uh, when we're going to have <coughs> enough renewables or enough wind or enough solar to uh, help us um, cover uh, the, the, the demand. Um, uh, and um, I went backwards, I think that's why I'm a bit confused. Uh, sorry, so, so, um, so yes, yeah, so that's where we are. So, so, what, so what we have in carbon awareness is the principle of using the energy at different times of the day when there might be uh, a cleaner source of energy. Uh, and then the idea is that we can do this at different times of the day, or we can do this in different locations. That's what we call time shifting and location shifting. And we also have the principle of uh, demand shaping. So in here, uh, what we're showing is an example of time shifting. So imagine the blue line to be the carbon, the, the carbon intensity throughout the day, and uh, it being you know, hard, uh, higher at the very beginning of the day then going down through the morning, and then by 8 a.m. it's gone back up. And so what we're saying is that if you're shifting your workload by a little bit, uh, depending on where the energy is going to be cleaner, you can um, have a, sl a smaller impact on the environment. Um, then we've got the same principle with uh, location shifting. So in this case, you might uh, imagine that uh, if you send your, your energy from a country that uh, uh, is currently heavy on fossil fuel, uh, to, an, uh, to, to a country that maybe it's the middle of the day there and there's a lot of sun and, for example, here Spain is, to me, known as a, a very uh, warm and uh, sunny country, um, uh, then it kind of like can make sense. Um, and then finally, uh, we've got what we call t demand shaping. And in this case, it's a little bit like uh, energy efficiency, but the other way around. It's instead of saying we're going to try and um, use an optimal level of energy, here we're talking about making the most of the energy that's cleaner. So if there's a time of the day where it's going to be cleaner, why don't we just do more work? An example, we've got solar panels at home, and I can tell you that as soon as the batteries are full and the sun is, is blaring outside, we'll go and switch on the machines or do things that we would have done during the night or at different other times when we wouldn't have been able to use that solar energy. We would have had to take it from the grid. So this is an example of demand shaping. So now we're going to cover the, the SDK. Back to you, Shimon. Thanks, Dan. So in principle, what we have here is, what we're presenting here is the Carbon Aware SDK is a tool um, developed by the Green Software Foundation, and it's a 1.0 release, soon to be 1.1. And um, in brief, why do we even care about it? Why do we want it? There has been a lot of talk already today on, um, um, on carbon awareness and also uh, around carbon data. So going back to it is we need people to understand the return on investment. So why should we even care about reducing uh, carbon intensity significantly? And uh, where can we start on this? Companies, not, not all of them, I mean, hopefully by now, they're getting more and more aware, but still it's, uh, it's an issue not fully addressed. There are disparate integration approaches. So we do have already a lot of really, really great tools existing for identifying carbon data, uh, electricity maps, what time, what carbon, and definitely many more, which I cannot just find from the top of my head. And uh, there is a lot of teams trying to address this issue internally at different uh, companies, um, embedding carbon awareness in, for example, uh, software updates in Windows and uh, Mac OS updates, you might have seen that uh, it's no longer updating uh, all the time, but it's doing it uh, carbon aware. If you're not, well, now you are. <laughs> and um, the next thing is that some teams just don't have access to data. Uh, it, it is, well, sometimes blocked. Um, it's not always also possible to audit previous carbon aware decisions. Uh, so if, let's say, you have a specific um, deployment in the cloud that is sitting in a particular location, and you know that this doesn't have to be bound to where you are located at the moment, um, it's harder to decide and to uh, 
prove uh, why you'd like to shift it to a completely different location without having an access to, to that data and showing exactly the stats, hey, moving this over here will give us this much, this much savings. Um, so how does this, uh, our uh, SDK address this, how does it actually look like? Um, on the left-hand side here, you have a very, very rough um, architecture diagram, or rather, implementation diagram of how you'd use the SDK in, in your application. Um, at the very bottom, um, we are accessing uh, third-party data on carbon intensity, so what time, electricity maps, or your own data. Uh, if someone, some of you have seen electricity maps presentation beforehand, they had a very interesting uh, infographic of a lot of data being uh, fed uh, into it and then being nicely processed from uh, power grid for, from power grids and what we're using is their already nicely processed carbon intensity data feeding into the carbon or SDK and then into your application and what this allows you to do is to create carbon aware software systems uh, in more in a more consistent manner and also to run hypothetical models um, of how um, how your um, application might, uh, so your application can deal with the shifts in carbon intensity in the future. So it, w it can um, be ready for when carbon might change in the next five hours, it might decide to move some of its um, work at a different time. Um, and uh, the next thing it does is it can allow you to abstract these data providers, so instead of being uh, locking into the single one, you can uh, switch around, or if you want to uh, develop new um, carbon, carbon data, uh, carbon logic into your software, um, rather than doing it per application basis, you have a single point of entry where you modify it and where you link your applications from. Um, so normally here is where I'd run through a demo of how these, this actual uh, SDK looks like. Uh, as I don't, couldn't connect my laptop here, I took a few screenshots of a Jupyter notebook um, of how this tool can be used uh, for um, looking at time shifting or location shifting. And the reason I chose Jupyter notebook is it is widely known, used by data scientists, and it's a very nice thing to see that, hey, this can be already run by you uh, in Python in, in your browser or wherever. Um, so I don't know if you can see the text, but um, the, the case this is suggesting here is a, of a software engineer that is um, looking at uh, the uh, carbon intensity of their specific de um, deployment. They're doing a uh, a machine learning job uh, every single day that is running for a specific time. And um, just by looking at the stat here, this is based on data from what time on one of their previous models. Um, looking at moving from West Central US at that time to France Central, which are Azure uh, regions, we could get up to 76% decrease um, in the carbon intensity uh, at, of that application, so in, of the carbon footprint, which is very significant. Um, and by looking at time shifting, this is what the code um, for our, your application might look like uh, to do it. The only actual line of code that is looking at the data is the API response and getting the best emissions data uh, for locations by time, and that's looking at a 24-hour period um, in uh, West Central US, which is in uh, Azure region. And what you get from here is you'll get at what time you can run, um, uh, you can, you, it, it would be best to run that job. And again, oh, let me just go back for a second. And again, if you were to, if you wanted to actually uh, verify whether this is correct. You probably would want to show this on a um, wider um, time window. So you could 
uh, do this on, let's say, a 55-day period to show how, how, how this might change. Similar for location shifting. Um, for location shifting, here's a graph of how this might look like if you were to move to a uh, different spot in, in the US. Um, as you can see on the, on the y-axis, we can see the carbon intensity. And on the x-axis, these are different um, uh, times, different days. And we're taking one measurement at 11.55 in two different locations. Um, and the decrease here is, I uh, didn't actually copy the percentage, sorry, but this will be roughly around 30% uh, by, by doing this, this shift. Um, and I'll just briefly mention here um, how you can incorporate this in uh, a Kubernetes environment, in a scalable application environment. Uh, this is a demo that uh, will, or sh will or soon should be available on the Carbon Aware SDK repository, um, where you have um, an application, a Python application producing some um, logs. Uh, let's say those are monthly invoices. And then we have another application that can be scaled up and processes each invoice one by one. And what we do is we can scale those applications, so deploy many of them to process data at once. And how we can incorporate the Carbon Aware SDK is we can use the data from it to find what are the greenest times um, when there is the lowest carbon intensity and spawn more of these applications. So we are doing demand shaping, we're shaping out how many pods are processing, and as soon as that um, falls below a certain threshold, uh, we scale back down. Um, and I'll quickly go through this, but without going into much detail, how then the Carbon Aware SDK addresses this pain point is it allows you for this uh, reporting and forecasting, so predicting and planning how the application might uh, scale or m move around in the future, as you saw on the Kubernetes exam example, brings a unified approach which can be used and integrated by anyone. It's an open source tool. Anyone can use it. Any corporation can incorporate in their uh, workflow. Um, and allows for high integrity and audit auditability, uh, allows you to look back at why certain decisions were made, and use data from verified sources without greenwashing. Um, and I'll hand off back to Jan for the wrap-up. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, so um, we hope that now you kind of more familiar with the carbon awareness uh, principle and how uh, the SDK can help you achieve that uh, by providing that kind of like extra layer to, to make it very easy to access data from different sources um, and how it can help you start working on your reporting. We understand that starting on the um, measurement uh, a journey is very difficult and that uh, you, know, it, you have to start somewhere and that could be the place where you can start that's very concrete and that's very um, uh, palpable for making business cases in your in your companies to help uh, improve the, your software uh, carbon footprint. Um, um, as um, I'm sorry if I if I butcher the name, but I think as Mark von Trioff uh, said this morning, uh, we need to work together. And so by taking a lot of um, uh, you know by all taking small steps as a whole, we can really make a, a massive impact. So. Um, one thing I'd like to call out is uh, how, so I think at the beginning I said that the GSF works through, uh, um, uh, um, helps uh, software professionals to reduce their impact through uh, advocacy, uh, research, and training. So this is a good uh, example of research. Uh, there's been a state of the green software report that's been published. Uh, it's come out yesterday, so it's fresh off the press. So you know, feel free to go to that address, stateof.greensoftware.org. Uh, to have a look at that report, there's a lot of really interesting data, and it's based on what people have told us uh, of their experience and what they're looking after, but also uh, very good research results. Um, also, we've got, uh, from a training point of view, we've got the learn.greensoftware.foundation uh, training that's available on the Linux Foundation um, uh, certification uh, um, uh, catalog. Um, so this 
is uh, expands on what we've been covering here for the Green Software Principles. And uh, we see this as a very good resource for you to be able to help uh, educate and advocate what you're trying to do in your companies through uh, to your colleagues and to your entourage so that everybody is basically using the same terms and understanding the same thing so that when we have conversations about this, we can progress a lot faster. So uh, please do uh, feel free to go there. Um, and uh, finally, um, the, green, the, the, the Carbon Aware SDK obviously is open source. Uh, it's available. Uh, we're looking for contribution as always. Uh, I think uh, at the moment we're on version one. <laughs> we are hoping to release version 1.1 very soon. The things where we need help with is, you know, helping with documentation, um, helping with creating samples. Those are things that we're planning on doing more. Uh, and obviously getting scenarios from the field from you on what else is missing that could help you uh, uh, using this tool. So I think that's it. Uh, thank you very much all for listening and um, good luck on your decarbonization, on, on your deep decarbonization journeys. Uh, do you have any questions? <laughs>
you know, we've got two types of information that you might be looking at, forecasting and looking back in time. And so the idea of the verification is, first I'm gonna say, okay, I'm, I'm looking to deploy workloads. Oh, I, okay, 8 p.m. is the best time to do this, it's gonna be cheaper in, in, in carbon. And then when you look back at it, you can look at the information that's been kind of revised to what the, 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 the mix must have been at that time, and then you can say, okay, it made sense or it didn't make sense, and then you can drive how you make better decisions going forward this way. So the verification is between forecasting and actual. No problem. Uh, we are at time, so uh, if, if you have any other questions, just grab us afterwards and we'll be make sure to answer. Sorry about that. Thank you for listening. Have a good day.